Good afternoon. Hi, if I could invite everyone in and take a seat. This is, um, this is my third session today, and uh, it's really been a great morning. And I've noticed that the um, attendees are really attentive. You just have to go, <clears throat> and they're, they instantly focus. It's, it's so nice um, to not have to fight with the audience. So thank you all so much for um, being here today. I know that you could be at a number of different sessions. And, um, and this um, topic, oh, actually, I'm referring to the slide. I thought my uh, first slide was going to be there. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> this topic uh, is um, uh, a, a good one uh, for us to look at targeted populations. And just the idea of inclusion and the idea of diversity, I think, is something that we in health generally struggle with. But I think First Nations are really good at it. They're very good at including uh, all populations and not being judgmental. Basically, First Nations people are, I think, very sophisticated. So I was really pleased when I was asked to um, address this issue because I, I knew that there would be lots of interesting things for us to discuss uh, here together. My presentation is about 20 slides, which I can go through fairly quickly because I wanted to leave time for us to talk for us to ask questions. And there are a number of people here could, who could have easily given this presentation or who could easily share this stage with me. Because actually, gay, lesbian, um, bisexual, transgendered health are actually four very large areas. And I'm really only an expert in one. As someone was saying, uh, you know, they only practice being gay on the weekends. <laughs> And, uh, and I only practice one of these, so not all four of them. So, no, I'm just kidding. What I meant to say really, instead of making a joke, right, the sacrifice of a joke, is that really there could be a number of us here talking about these subjects. And thus, I would like to leave a lot of time uh, for um, all of you to, to, to participate in a discussion and in comments, rather than me taking center stage for a really long time. Uh, and putting me to sleep. Because really, I'm after, this is, like I said, my third session, I, I really am getting tired of hearing myself. So uh, today's topic is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and two-spirited health, braving equality in First Nations and Aboriginal health. Uh, and thus, we want to bring everyone with us in our quest for better health for First Nations in this province. So what does that look like? So this is, um, uh, these are my um, youngest boys. They're twins, Jay and Quinn. They're moms and um, my sisters. And I purposely included these um, because um, within my own family, there's been an evolving uh, knowledge and acceptance of um, the different kinds of families that we can have. That certainly at the beginning when I came out to my parents, and my parents, one of my, one of my parents went to residential school when she was three, and she's very Christian, and thus she was very nervous about having a gay son. And my dad grew up in the bush with a very liberal um, First Nations culture from Slam and where, um, where it wasn't Victorian or Christian based, and, and um, they weren't, my father wasn't sexophobic. So he had heard that men could be together. It wasn't a big deal. So um, at the beginning, when I came out to them, my mother was, well, she was puzzled. She really had no idea how two men could be together in that way. So my dad had to explain it to her. <laughs> and for my dad, he said, oh, yeah, I heard of that. I kind of thought, it's not a, not a big deal. But uh, so we went from fairly good acceptance to um, uh, them having an understanding that my relationships were equal to my sister's relationships, that my uh, marriage was not second class to my sister's marriages. And uh, what, did that, what did that mean in the everyday? And what did that mean around children and families? So I just want to put this up as uh, just one formation of what a, a queer or a gay lesbian family might look like. 
And uh, for many of you, you know that we don't live just in a binary society. Uh, many of us grow up thinking that we're supposed to learn to act in a particular way. And uh, particularly for men, I think, I think particularly for men, because we grew up in such a sexist environment, being feminine or being female-like or woman-like or girl-like is considered acting in an inferior fashion because of our sexism. So we're taught not to do it um, when really, what's wrong with being a woman? What's wrong with a man acting in a more feminine fashion and vice versa? When I was an actor um, in theater school, the women had a much easier time assuming male roles. It was more socially acceptable or they could make that leap much more easily than the reverse. Men were much more phobic about taking on female roles. They had many more anxieties, many more issues. So the, the, this um, depiction, oh, is that your, <laughs> that's funny. So the, the gender-bred um, person just delineates for us our binariness around um, self-identification as female or woman versus male and everything in between in that spectrum around gender queerness. Uh, the feminine, the masculine, and an androgynous or two-spirited position where we are both male and female, or we are neither. The idea of a biological sex and a genetic sex, uh, and a phenotypical or a physical type as female or male or intersexed, and our sexual orientation or the object of our desire as being male or female or somewhere in between. And the idea of two-spiritedness is actually an old concept for us, but a, a new one as well with a new twist, uh, in that um, we can identify as two-spirited or having the spirit of a man or woman um, in, a, in a single body, um, or that we are a continuum of both spirits uh, in a single body, uh, and that this two-spiritedness, this identity, is nested within a colonial context, in that Two-spiritedness started to be a term that was used um, with gay, lesbian, bi, trans rights increasing um, post-Stonewall, at least in American, Canadian, Eurocentric society uh, around gay, lesbian, bi, trans identities uh, from about 50 years ago. However, traditionally, we have two-spirited roles, and very often two-spirited um, peoples were healers, they were medicine people, they were leaders, and just to, be, to use very common language, they, they could exist within a society um, as warriors or as caregivers or as parents or as your brothers and sisters and your aunts and uncles. Um, they could live on the margins of society, maybe as um, cultural keepers, um, maybe as healers, uh, sometimes they were like second wives or second husbands uh, who had sex with members of society, but they weren't at the center of society. And sometimes they existed outside of society. They were clearly um, banished from society. They lived completely um, away from everyone else because there wasn't a place from them for them in that particular community as a day-to-day -day person. They were someone you went to only in extraordinary circumstances. So um, the idea of how many of us there are or where we are um, is an interesting one. Uh, I think that the common belief is that 10% of us are queer. Um, but if you um, do a survey, and here's one survey, very famous uh, life survey from uh, the United States that identifies really about 3% of men self-identifying as gay, and about one and a half percent of women self-identifying as lesbian. Um, but sexual activity is different, again. Like men having same-sex behavior uh, was, uh, sorry, having behavior, sexual behavior with members of the same gender as being about 10%, and 5% of women uh, reporting woman-to-woman um, -woman sexual activity. It's very important for us to remember um, all of these ideas within the context of the First Nations and Aboriginal perspective on wellness, 
This model is one that was built over many, many, many months, even years, of consultation um, with you, uh, First Nations healthcare workers um, in British Columbia, in that we have a very lofty view of health as a holistic issue, one where we can hold a lot of different ideas around health together at once. And so we can consider our, in the outer circle, for instance, our social well-being, our cultural well-being, our neck economic well-being, and our environmental well-being. Even though we may only work in one of those areas, or maybe in none of those areas, or that we have only a strong understanding in a particular area, but not necessarily in another area, that the people that we have insisted on a holistic approach. So, for instance, if we're given a problem like, say, uh, a pipeline, someone proposes a pipeline through our territory, we can use this model, certainly we at the First Nations Health Authority must consider this model, because we've officially adopted it, that we need to consider the health ramifications of a pipeline in all of these different areas. So uh, a simplistic answer like we need a pipeline because we're poor and we need the money is an insufficient answer. We need to look at it with many different lenses and say, well, what about you know, community? What about culture? What about the future? What about the babies? Uh, we, ask, we need to ask those questions um, in, in, in assessing any kind of health question. So in looking, in, in looking at um, two-spirited health, uh, today I would like to apply this particular holistic First Nations specific lens uh, to discuss our health and well-being. So the First Nations Health Authority uh, is a health and wellness partner. We have very strong principles of inclusion. We want um, better health for all First Nations, not just First Nations people that we like. And uh, uh, we have responsibility for our two-spirited um, members. Our commitment is to support health and wellness from the youngest uh, to the oldest, remembering that a very large part of our population is young, and uh, young people have a lot of sexual activity. We um, have a lot of evidence that young people have, are sexually active. <laughs> <laughs> and probably you have stories from your own families that your young people are sexually active. And when we look from our viewpoint as older people, that sometimes we don't talk about sexual health and sexual behaviors easily enough. Um, this is a, um, a health indicator that we've been looking at for a long time. I've presented it many times before. This is around HIV-related mortality from 1993 until 2006. And the bottom line is HIV-related mortality for other British Columbians. And the top line is HIV-related mortality for First Nations. The line is a trend line. The actual numbers of deaths are um, the dots. And you can see in the light blue dots, that there was an enormous drop in HIV-related mortality around 1997 with the introduction of highly active antiretroviral therapy. Literally, a magic pill that changed HIV from a fatal illness to a chronic illness, and that changed um, people's lives from having a death sentence to that they could live with HIV, well, uh, for as long as um, anyone else was living who didn't have HIV. And that this magic pill and the caregivers who gave this magic pill and its attendant care um, were changing health outcomes and very few people suddenly were dying from HIV, at least in the non-Aboriginal population. So you see the dots, just bottom line there, and there are very few deaths. However, for us as First Nations, even in the presence of uh, a magic bullet, that our HIV-related death, deaths continue to go up and up and up. And uh, we wonder um, why this might be. I have some newer data. data. It will come up and it, will, and it brings up new issues again for us. Unfortunately, some bad news, but uh, I'm just showing you this for now. So, so even in the presence of good care, even in the presence of a good care system, even in the presence of extraordinary health technology, literally down the street from us, um, Indians weren't getting it. 
we were still dying. And so this begs the question, maybe we know what to do to improve the health of our people. Maybe those services already exist, but it's not reaching us. The caregivers are not meeting with us, maybe. Those pills are not getting in our mouths, maybe. And so what are those obstacles? And these obstacles to care appear to be about our culture, appear to be about our culture, who we are, where we live, and thus pertains to us as two-spirited people just because of the color of our skin. So issues like geographic isolation, and I'm sure that in your groups this morning, people were already asking, what about access? What about access in our rural community? What about access in our part of the province? Are you going to make it better? Um, the issues of social isolation, that many of our community members are isolated from general community, whether that general community means the rest of our reserve or the rest of our Aboriginal community or the rest of greater society, but that that social isolation, that feeling that we are apart from everyone else and we're not a part of their work or their services or their lives uh, is an important aspect for us to identify and knock out of the way. A lack of confidence in the system and in personnel. And what I did notice here, this gathering wisdom, is much more confidence in the system that five years ago we spent a lot more time saying the system doesn't work, you don't care about us, and um, this time many more of us feel like we are part of the system, we can contribute to the system and we have control of the system. And hopefully it's much, much clearer to you all that this is our system and it's well within our power to transform that system so it helps more of us. Uh, previous experience with our health systems can color uh, how we think a current situation might proceed. That there are compelling distractions, certainly in the downtown east side where there were a number of persons living with HIV um, who needed um, good care. Um, they were distracted by some of the issues around them, including issues like homelessness, including issues like mental health and substance use um, issues. Um, if you're a woman in the downtown east side, um, the danger of exploitation and oppression is extreme. Having worked down there for many years, um, women um, with addictions in the downtown east side have very powerful forces working against them to keep them where they are uh, in exploited and disrespectful positions. That the social determinants of health are important for outcomes that even if I could cure HIV or cancer, if I did that and threw you back in the street into your homeless situation where you were working as a sex worker, that I haven't done everything that I can within my power to give you a better um, quality of life. And so we must address those social determinants of health. Um, health literacy, this is an issue that was brought up time and again by our CEO, Joe Gallagher, um, yesterday afternoon. I know it was hard to hear him because he was time pressured, but he had a very strong message around health literacy that our own health knowledge that we, that we have collectively as a group or that we have collectively within our communities or that we have individually does enable better outcomes. If we know how to help, um, then we do help. If we know how to live longer, then we do live longer. And the idea of um, knowledge as being a health protector and a health promoter is one that he conveys a lot and one that we second as well. And so as uh, physicians, we don't want to just keep looking at the ones who are already sick, but look to the idea of um, uh, protecting health, protecting our own health. Um, issues of privacy uh, keep us from seeking care. Um, historical institutional neglect. We can think that certain institutions are not going to help us. They're just going to treat us badly and give us yet another colonial experience. And part of my job is to reassure you that you can go to hospitals and physicians, say, uh, and get the best care possible, that you should and can uh, demand those. Uh, stigmatization, we've spoken quite a lot about um, before, uh, that if we um, keep painting a picture of ourselves as not being well, or as uh, Dr. Shannon Waters was mentioning today, because her mother 
died younger. Uh, and because the health statistics say that Aboriginal women don't live as long as other women, um, that she can sublimate that idea that, oh, well, we just don't, we just aren't going to live as long, and that she needs to work against that consciously um, to live a longer life. Microaggressions are the baloney that people keep throwing at us. Things like when you're at, when I was at a hospital once, um, someone, uh, one of the caregivers said to me, oh, you guys get everything for free anyway, right? Which made me furious, because I don't know what that means. That's really quite a ridiculous, um, lazy comment. Um, but that kind of microaggression, or even sometimes overt aggression, uh, against us can affect our care. Uh, caregiver ignorance of our realities. Uh, I was part of a study looking at um, historical trauma um, in persons in the downtown east side. And uh, in our intakes in the downtown east side clinically, we weren't asking patients if they'd been to residential school. And that meant that we didn't know about a very important factor in, in a person's mental health and uh, well-being and that that was really an ignorance on our part, uh, and that if you ask physicians, do you know what a residential school is? Do you know why you need to ask that of, a, of your clients? Um, that that needed to, to be addressed. Racism is alive and well, and I hope you're following the Brian Sinclair case in Manitoba. I was speaking to one of the First Nations medical health officers there, and I said to her, uh, so was racism a factor in the fact that that um, First Nations man didn't get care and was allowed to die in the eMERGE? She said, duh. Literally, she said, duh, to me. She said, of course, of course there was racism in that eMERGE room, and that's why he was uh, left to die and no one helped him. And there are probably other issues, other obstacles to care. But I, I just want to leave this topic for now and get back to um, factors affecting us specifically um, in two-spirited health. So this is a listing that comes from uh, the American Public Health Association. I um, urge you to Google um, 2010 GLBT Health, 2010 GLBT Health, and a 500-page report on gay, lesbian, bi, trans health will come up. It's a, a very well-researched um, item, and it uh, looks at um, these particular factors um, around these populations. So first is genetics. This is not a modifiable um, factor, so we don't spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, access to quality health services. Do we have culturally safe um, services where we can go, where we feel safe? Um, our environment, our environment includes um, our physical environment and living conditions. And remember, this is not unique to gay, lesbian, bi, trans health. Um, our social environment, uh, I think that if I was growing up here with all of you, I would feel really, really safe to be uh, an openly gay uh, man, and I am open to you and, and out. Um, but in certain other social situations, people may not feel safe uh, to be who they are. Uh, what is our work environment like? A number of gay, lesbian, bi, trans persons uh, stay in the closet at work. It's not a safe place for them to talk about um, uh, their particular personal lives, and this is unfortunate. And in our family situations, uh, our, our families uh, are our nests. Our families are places where we find love and support uh, where um, we're nurtured, uh, where we find people to help us with the day-to-day -day, um, to financially support us. And um, if those families are, are rejecting or if we don't have the same ability to, to have a family as others, this can affect our well-being. I wanted to make another point here on, on family. Uh, um, my husband's family was very rejecting when he came out, and uh, he left South Africa to come to Canada where he would have more freedom. 
and uh, I, I always felt really bad for him, and I thought, oh, I, I wonder how many Aboriginal families are that rejecting? Because, you know, I came from a very accepting situation, but certainly my family isn't necessarily like all Aboriginal families, that maybe some Aboriginal two-spirited people um, have had um, rejecting family experiences, and that would be really interesting to explore. And it, this is just my opinion, that I think um, uh, generally we are much more uh, accepting and less homophobic in, in Indian country, especially when we're more traditional um, than colonized. Um, educational and community-based programs can help with our health and well-being. For example, uh, around homophobia, that, uh, that we can be talking about um, families and family structures, about gay, lesbian, bi, trans, health, um, within the school system that can be helpful. Thank you. I have, uh, I have six kids, and I know that for them, uh, it's been actually very easy to grow up with two dads, but it gets harder when they enter the school system and they have to talk about that situation with other kids, because those other kids may or may not have knowledge of that different kind of family structure. And so the problem is not within the home, but within the school system where they start to get challenged my, you know, by, by classmates who say, what, you have two dads? How is that possible? Um, health communication, do we direct or target our health messaging to be inclusive? Where's Doug Kelly? He's not here. I was laughing yesterday to myself. Doug Kelly is not homophobic at all. In fact, he quite teases me, and he's, he's, um, he's totally cool with it. But yesterday he was saying, well, you know how you control a Coast Salish man with a Coast Salish woman? And I wanted to say, oh, no, wait. wait. <laughs> it's not a Coast Salish woman controlling me. <laughs> it's a white South African. <laughs> Um, HIV AIDS is the 14th leading cause of death for the total population of the US and the leading cause of death for African American men 25 to 44 years old. Really unfortunate situation in the United States and we know that um, HIV is an issue for heterosexual women of childbearing age in this province who are First Nations but also for um, uh, First Nations uh, men who have sex with men. We'll come back to that. There are particular, particular communicable diseases that may affect our populations, particularly sexually transmitted um, diseases that we should be able to speak freely and openly about. And cancers can affect uh, gay, lesbian, bi, trans populations differently. These are our most recent results around new cases of HIV. Uh, you can see females in purple. You can see men uh, in blue, and uh, total is in gray. Uh, and this is from 2002 to 2011. The really important news here is that there is a decreasing, decreasing trend to new cases of HIV for British Columbia. We are unique in the country, maybe even in the world, in that we have a decreasing trend to new cases of HIV. Uh, it is really quite extraordinary. We've had, we've had very good efforts here. And you see that our new cases of HIV are very, very low. The cases for men, though, the blue line, uh, recently spiked, and they're still spiking. Our newest data from this year is that um, HIV infections amongst men are rebounding, and that downward trend uh, uh, is now back towards an upward trend, and that the majority of those cases are not heterosexual transmission for First Nations, but um, uh, men who have sex with men. And so the outreach to First Nations, men who have sex with men, needs to continue, but we also need to be doing um, outreach to um, straight men uh, who might be IV drug users or who might be getting it from heterosexual contact uh, so we need to have them both. Um, lesbian, gay, um, bi, trans health includes mental health, so we wouldn't be just looking at the bodies of um, two-spirited peoples, uh, but their um, mental health as well, and their, um, some would say as well, their uh, spiritual and emotional well-being. 
So um, the idea of teaching resilience is an important one. I was literally at a meeting uh, where the presenter was talking about suicide and said he gave different, these different scenarios on when should we intervene on this young adult who is suicidal. Should we intervene when they declare that they want to die? Should we intervene when they're holding the knife in their hand and threatening to commit suicide? Should we intervene post first suicide attempt? And, and he even said, and if they escalate, like if they, get a, if they pick up something uh, more violent like a gun, should we intervene f faster? And, and of course, uh, we are interested in mental health emergencies response, uh, particularly as medical health officers and the new First Nations Health Authority. But lots and lots and lots and lots of people have said to us, don't you think you should respond sooner than when they're at the point of death? Don't you think your mental health services should support young people before they are seconds from death? And that, of course, <laughs> makes perfect sense. And thus, the idea of resilience or mental health programs that keep our mental health strong uh, is one that we need to bring to the fore. So I suggest that um, mental health services that protect mental health, youth programs that are around identity, around well-being, around flourishing, um, and maybe centered around activities that are not death-related, but maybe even something like basketball and fun are very legitimate and valid um, mental health programs that we should be promoting. Substance abuse is uh, an issue in our population. It is uh, slightly different uh, in that the culture around um, drug misuse and drug abuse and drug dependency has a slightly different social skew than perhaps the general population and uh, thus we need to make inroads uh, uh, therein that can uh, mean we give effective messaging and effective services when and where it's needed. Uh, tobacco use is still an issue in our population as well. And because we don't have a gay, lesbian, bi, trans identifier at the province or anywhere else, I actually can't tell you if um, uh, gays or lesbians, for instance, smoke more than the general population, drink more or less than the general population, um, or uh, use or misuse drugs. I actually have no idea. And if we identify gay, lesbian, bi, trans populations as being important for us to target, maybe we need to search for uh, some data on uh, incidence and prevalence, basic incidence and prevalence. Uh, physical activity. Physical activity for women is affected by their sense of safety doing those physical activities. Do they have places that are safe places for them to run, walk, um, camp, um, have just have regular physical activity? Ditto for gay, lesbian, bi, trans um, populations. They need safe spaces in order to have physical activity to promote and better their own health. Uh, and this may include um, uh, gay, lesbian, bi, trans, safe physical activity venues. It may. It's just a suggestion, an idea, uh, that a safe place for physical activity is one that we can afford to others. Uh, body image and mental health or feeling good about one's appearance is a central idea, one that we don't talk about very easily, I think, uh, generally. How do, um, how do we, as gay men, perceive ourselves and perceive others? How do we, as lesbians, view our own bodies? How do um, we, as transgendered persons or as bisexual persons, view our own bodies, and how does that love or hate or everything in between about how we look affect our outlook on our health and well-being? And I just want to say that uh, recently in a discussion, it was, actually it wasn't recently, it's been more than a few years now, but really it's only been like three years at the most, I was talking to a minister of health about surgeries, about um, 
gender-based surgeries. And uh, he said, are we in charge of this? And I had to say, uh, yes, we are concerned about the health of all British Columbians. Absolutely. So yes, we need to talk about who's going to pay for um, sex reassignment surgeries. Uh, so the idea of body image, bodies, mental health, and mental wellness are central concepts. Uh, we have a public health infrastructure, which includes health promotion, which includes health protection, which includes health planning, and uh, health policy. And do all of these include two-spirited people? And I dare say, at this point, no, we don't apply that lens often enough. We don't think about planning for two-spirited populations enough. We don't think about health policy development for two-spirited people uh, enough. We don't talk about health promotion in two-spirited populations enough. And we don't talk about health protection uh, with that lens often enough. I've mentioned sexually transmitted infections. Violence is a large area uh, in that um, some gay, lesbian, bi, trans organizations of late have been entirely focused on the idea of homophobia and bullying, that violence is a per, uh, pervasive um, influence on the health and well-being of their young people. And so many of their efforts are anti-bullying uh, and uh, many of their mental health efforts and their anti-suicide efforts are all about bullying. But violence is not just uh, external. Uh, and the idea of violence um, coming in the form of bullying from another young person is not a... Uh, uh, we can expand that concept to be a little more inclusive in that um, violence against two-spirited peoples can also come in the form of homicide, we know that there was uh, a homicide, uh, sorry, uh, homophobic homicide on a First Nations reserve in the last two years here in this province. We know that domestic violence between uh, intimate partners does occur, and are we talking about it and addressing it enough? And we know the concept of self-harm or suicide or suicidal behaviors, like suicide attempts, not just completed suicides, uh, are alive and well. And are we doing enough to discuss this? For instance, recently, the chief coroner issued a report after we, and I, and I literally mean we, because I was on that panel, when we looked at um, uh, suicide in young people, one of our recommendations was we need to find a way to ask if this young person who's died uh, was gay, lesbian, bi, trans, uh, self-identified? And was that a part of their um, decision to take their own life? And is this something that we can ask, or how do we ask this so that the family is, feels safe in talking about that possibility? You can imagine how delicate a situation that is to ask if this young person who has just passed away um, had gay, lesbian, bi, trans, identified issues uh, and that if that played a part. Because we, we, we think, we suspect that a significant proportion of youth suicides are related to their um, two-spirited identity. Um, homophobia, ignorance, uh, fear, uh, still out there, still making it a bit difficult. I'm trying to think of a homophobic situation I've had recently. I'm such, I have such a privileged position um, in that I don't get a lot of sass, like, oh, except here in the front row. I don't, get, I don't get sassed a lot about being gay. <laughs> so I don't ha have a story, but if those, but it may be when we open up the floor, um, those of you out here can, uh, can share some stories about um, homophobic situations that are instructive to us about how we might help. And this is issue about what I've just described around the chief corner. Um, suggesting that we ask around, around uh, gay, lesbian, bi, trans, queer identities and two-spirited identities uh, in our follow-up. Um, here's a, um, a very important uh, document from the Institute of Medicine. And it, it looks at issues of disparity within the health system. Uh, these are disparities that are, um, these are health disparities that come from the system itself 
um, not from the patient's behavior, say, um, where we see bias and stereotyping affecting caregivers, affecting how they care for us, and that widen disparities and challenge our equality and our equity. Uh, we as uh, two-spirited people also wish for culturally safe environments where I can say my husband without someone falling off a chair. And I did have someone recently almost fall off their chair when I said my husband. And they said, well, what? <laughs> and I said, my husband. And they said, did you just say your, your husband? And they said, yeah, my husband, a man. Because I think they thought that I was ESL or that I didn't quite have the terminology right. <laughs> and they said, yeah, my husband, a man. So diversity, it's in all of us. I, I don't think there's um, a straight, white, middle class, heterosexual male exclusively uh, in this crowd. We're all different and diverse in some way. And that equal opportunity for all of us, not just a certain few of us, um, is what's uh, moral and right. Emo, thank you. Here's my, my husband and some of my kids. <laughs> so let's, um, let's thank you. Let's um, throw the... Uh... Okay. okay. So uh, is there a roving mic? Can we take one question? One comment? Oh my gosh, I totally lost control. Yeah, we have five minutes. My apologies. Anyone want to comment? I want to thank you, uh, Evan, for, for having this, because this is something I've been asking for for a long time, to have this addressed. I'm the parent of a transgendered daughter. And when my daughter decided to come out, of course, I, I knew that she was gay for, you know, since she was very little. And I was blamed for that. It was my fault. And I had to witness a lot of bullying from her friends and family because they wanted to make her into a little boy. And it was really tough to see that. And I was victimized to that. So I've been really advocating for a lot of this. To, be, to come out. Let's talk about this. Let's um, share. Let's take down the fears, the barriers. Um, and I'm, I really hold my hands up for you to, to do this because Thank you. it takes courage. And I really want everyone to, to take some of that courage for yourselves to be able to share. I love what Don Bernstick said the other night. He said that there was four lessons he was taught to wellness. And unfortunately, I only remember three of them because he went, kind of went through them so, so quickly. And one of the first things was sharing so that you could cry. And I thought that was so wonderful. I loved those words because this has been such a deep, dark secret for so long, and we've got enough secrets. We've got enough pain to deal with. These are our beautiful young people. Um, I, I would just really hold my hands up to everybody if you could take some courage now today to be able to openly talk about these for yourself and your, for your communities, for your friends. It's getting easier. I love that there, in the media and, and television, there's a lot of talk about gay friends and, and a lot of the younger people, to me anyway, are so much more accepting than people in my generation. But I know there's, it's still hard out there. I still hear a lot of moms having to go through what I did, saying, it's your fault. Those kind of things don't need to happen anymore. 
So thank you for, I'm, I'm really thrilled to see so many people here. Yes. I really am. Thank you, thank you so much and I'm, I'm going to leave it there and I hope that you see yourselves and your beautiful young people um, in this plan. Thanks very much, good afternoon. Big thanks to Evan, that was really great. Uh, coming up in just a few minutes, we are going to have uh, Dr. Nadine Caron uh, from the UBC Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health talking to us about some of the initiatives that are happening with the center. So feel free to check that out.